Hello. If you want to support us here at The Contemporary Gentleman, you can buy into our spy series, links below. And depending on when this was recorded, we may or may not have an Instagram and or Patreon. Uh, if we do, links are below. Cheers. Okay. Oh, this is so much better than the 16 inch. Why do you say that though? It, the balance. Donaldson here and into the gentleman's disclosure I'm bringing you a video on long barrel for short barrel kind of just overall barrel length uh, I understand that this is a topic that has been beaten to death but of course as I normally do if I'm going to cover a subject that a lot of other people have covered it's usually going to be with kind of a more fresh take um, a different angle of view if you will so if you want to hear kind of my my arguments for kind of both or really more SBR length, um, stay tuned. So, uh, which to pick, what the benefits are of each, and of course, uh, as always, all items were provided to me by a third party. So jumping right into the meat and potatoes, let's hit on the thing that everyone's going to bring up first, especially as an argument for having a longer barrel, and that's velocity. In fact, I myself have talked about velocity in plenty of other videos, although more often as they, it pertains to pistols, but I digress. Um, so in velocity, you got some variables within that. So twist rate, bullet weight, and then of course your barrel length. But also, what I want to mention about barrel length is there is a point of diminishing returns. And that, so for instance, going from 10.3 to 11.5, there's an enormous gain in velocity and some other benefits. No question about it. But when you go from 16 to 20, or 16 to 18 to 20, um, you're not getting as, as big a strides. Um, even 14.5 to 16 is kind of an impressive gain in capability. So one thing to consider is when, when you're kind of in a certain area of barrel selection, what are you giving up to go from 16 to 20 or 16 to 18 or 14.5 to 16? Um, and what are some other parts of the configuration? So um, in regard to that, uh, something to consider when looking at specifically what barrel length and how long. Now going back to bullet weight, the bullet weight is going to have an impact on velocity. Now as I've said before, using your barrel to get more velocity over bullet weight mathematically looks better. So when you double a bullet's velocity, you quadruple its energy. When you double a bullet's weight, you double its energy. So obviously you're not doubling a bullet's weight and you're not you know, doubling your barrel length in many cases, some I guess you could. But the point is, is that still, when you cut it down to the smaller fractions, there are still bigger gains from increasing barrel length. However, you know, nothing, nothing is just going to be uh, no compromise, right? You're always going to have trade-offs. And so what I kind of want to talk, what I'm going to focus on is some of these other things you're trading off. Because yes, on paper, 16-inch barrel, that's awesome. Uh, that's a great weapon to have and I really went back and forth myself on uh, if that should be my main gun or not uh, and I kind of decided no which is what this video is about uh, and getting up to twist rate you're going to have primarily three different twist rates for um, for your 5.56 guns at least right and most of this kind of this video is focused at 5.56 that said there's going to be application to other calibers as well um, but really, when you go changing calibers, you can kind of make up for um, 5.56 uh, short barrel, 
shortcomings, I guess I will say it. Um, right, so like, through a blackout, part of its benefit is that you can get very similar velocity out of a 9-inch barrel with a supersonic round as, in theory, a 14.5556. Now, there's a bunch of caveats to that, so don't just hear me say that and think that's all that's going on with it. There's a lot more to it. But, as a for instance. So, again, focusing on 5.56. Now, um, twist rate, like I said, they're... Their twist rates are selected by the military, I think it's 1 in 7, because um, it's a good twist rate for stabilizing a tracer. It's a very unstable round, so it um, doesn't mean it's going to be the best. Now, faster twist rates are going to have a better effect on heavier bullets. So, as it stands, if you're going with something like an SBR, you're going to want to have something like 75, 77 grain really no less than 62 um, because you got the faster twist rate on this MCX with the 1.7 and you're going to want to make up for that loss of velocity by upping the bullet weight. So all kind of variables there, all things to consider. Now it's well and easy most of the time to acquire a 75 grain or 77 grain. A little more expensive but in the end uh, that works. Now. You know, end of days, apocalypse, everyone likes to talk about. And as uh, business is going down south right now, it's looking a little dicey, right? So if you have to source 5.56 or you come upon 5.56, you're going to have an easier time just throwing whatever in to your 16-inch because it's going to handle that stuff no sweat. Whereas the SBR, it's going to shoot it, it's going to fire it, but it's going to be a little harder to really maximize the power of this setup versus the 16 inch. So, um, <clears throat> I know it sounds like I'm kind of pushing you toward, six, uh, toward the longer barrels, but bear with me. So one thing that's talked about is, right, on your shorter barrels, they're actually going to be more consistently accurate, or the repeatable accuracy will be better in theory, because the barrel is not sticking out as far and it weighs less, and so droop, when you heat up the barrel, is going to be less. Therefore, you're going to have a tighter group. Um, <clears throat> so I've seen people test, but they didn't necessarily heat up the barrel. And the groups were definitely better with the longer barrel. So like in this case, it would be a 16 inch. Now again, the theory behind it is as you heat up the barrel. So how long does it take your barrel to heat up? What kind of rounds are you putting down? What ammo? It's, there's just so many variables to generalize. I used to think, oh, short barrel, more accurate. Now I realize there's a lot more to it than just that. So, um, size does matter, but it's pretty impressive what uh, you can achieve with a short barrel. So another thing to get into is what is the bullet doing when it gets to where it's going, right? So there's a saying, and it's uh, bullet energy never killed anything. So a lot of people are like, oh, minimum of thousand foot-pounds of energy to kill a deer, all that. Um, I think it's a good guideline, especially if you're beginning out, if you're more experienced. I think there's a good guidelines to follow, but I think at the end of the day, I mean, it's the internet, right? can't believe everything you say. That's why I hope to one day get out and do more of this than just research a lot of it and do some of it. But there's people shooting deer with subsonic 300 blackout, and uh, their point is the right round. And I think some of those people are probably full of it, and I think some of those people are probably doing it. And I think at the end of the day, I've, I, I have been a proponent of this, it does come down to the bullet and what it does when it gets there. That's why, I mean, you've got this array of 9mm ammunition for handguns that do all kinds of different things. Sometimes intentionally, sometimes not. So, you know, are you using fragmenting ammo out of your SBR and you're shooting somebody or something at 100 yards and uh, it's, it's a good grain for your barrel, maybe 75 grain? your gun's probably going to perform great. Whereas if you're using some kind of like just ball ammo, 55 grain, yeah, 100 yards with 16 inch, um, if the bullet tumbles, it's going to accomplish some good things. But if it doesn't, you're passing right through and it's not dumping any of its energy or causing any extra damage than just passing through. Which depending on where it passes through, you may not have to fire your gun anymore. But there's a lot of places it could pass through where you're not really taking anyone out of the fight. Versus again, a fragmenting round 
from an SBR is going to do, do a lot of damage. So um, again, what's your bullet doing? So maneuverability is pretty obvious. I mean, hell, I just like having SBRs for these videos because you, it's very, they're easier to keep in frame, right? So, um, but just, you know, with a, can, with a can on it, or especially without, um, just being able to move the gun around, operate it, you know, in and out of cars. I love the MCX, being able to fold the back right. So, at the end of the day, um, I mean, this is just going to have maneuverability on the 16 inch or longer barrels in general overall, especially once you start adding cans on the end. Now, another thing to consider is some people, let's say in a really foresty area, they're thinking like, okay, I'm outdoors, could be a long shot, better go with the 16 inch, right? Well, here's the thing is, especially if you have a can, your maneuverability around trees in a forested area is not very good, and you're not going to have long shots anyway. So why give up the maneuverability for a benefit that you will likely not be able to reap? So, um, when it comes to a 16 inch, I'm really going to go for one if I'm out in a very hilly slash open area, right? Nebraska. Not a lot of trees. May be more viability for this kind of gun um, versus where I'm at in Kansas. Yes, there are hills and plains just nearby, not far away, and I may travel to them, but in a scenario where I'm having to use a gun, I'm still probably going to go with this because there are ravines, there are valleys. This maneuverability is going to be better. The weight's going to be less. And also, with all the wind, you're just not rolling up with a 16 inch in Kansas. You know, for whatever it is zombie apocalypse, civil war, whatever, whatever it may be, fighting an invasion from another country, you're just not going to go up with a gun like this and just start making thousand yard shots across the plains of Kansas. Like, you're just not. It's unrealistic. Um, no wind? Maybe. If you get enough trigger time on your gun? A little more realistic, but again, it's it's just not a scenario that will A, likely happen, or B, is going to play out the way you think it is. So weight and balance, right? Something that I'm bitching a lot about in my MCX reviewing. Um, even if I had gas guns in front of me, the balance is just going to be better on the SBR. Like, it just is. All the weight is further back, especially once you're attaching shit. You want your light as far forward as possible. Lambs, laser aiming module, you can definitely get away with scooting back. And in many cases, I pretty much recommend people do that. Now, uh, but the light should be scooted forward, and sometimes you're scooting it forward even more, like a T-Rex arms light bar, to really get it out there. Um, I think that's great. I don't think the light bar is perfect for all scenarios, but I think it's a really great thing to have on hand. Um, again, suppressor, right? So let's talk about that for a second. A duty suppressor is going to weigh upwards of 15 ounces, right? Usually. So an exception being like the Flow 556Ks, about 11 ounces, I want to say. So it's an exception, but most like a Surefire is, I want to say, 16 or 17 ounces, maybe 18, I think 16 or 17. Right, the Gemtech one that you see me run a lot, um, it's like 17 ounces. So the point is you got a lot of weight. And so, as I talk about in many videos, your perceived weight matters. So weight right here, adding it right here, it's going to feel different and not as heavy, even if it's the same object, which in my case it is, as weight out here. So you know, you you could probably understand what I'm what I'm on about here with weight and balance, right? And kind of why I specify balance is it's not necessarily the weight that's bad. It's the location of the weight and the unbalancing of the gun. So finally, weapon profile. Um, that really just refers to like the size of the weapon and all that. And then we'll get into optics, but like you know. It's going to lend well to use certain optics on one versus the other. So yeah, the just the sizing of the weapon, you know, it, this, I mean, it's kind of a silly note because it kind of goes back to maneuverability, but this is way easier to throw into a bag or conceal in my truck or something. Whereas a 16 inch, a little bit more of an issue. It does help on this particular MCX, of course, that I can fold the stock, but still, this is way bigger as you can see, can't even fit it in the frame. So getting into caveats and variables, 
Um, <clears throat> how are you training? And what are you training for? This is probably one of the biggest things that, that started to hit me in actually using these two guns parallel to each other. Um, most of my training is 50 yards and in. Partly because that's what's available to me. And partly because, so, I train some CQB for the Army. I have gotten good lessons from individuals in the Army. I've heard horrible things from individuals in the Army. I've worked hard to go outside the Army to get a lot of gun training to include CQB. I'm not going to act like I know everything. I know some really good principles. And what I've kind of seen versus shooting long range is if you're called upon to do CQB, which you don't want, it's a bad idea, but you may have to do it. So if you're called upon to do CQB, you should be really, 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 really good at it. Still dangerous, but less dangerous than if you occasionally do CQB and you do more of your shooting at a thousand yards. Whereas vice versa, <clears throat> the danger level, if you fail to perform at a thousand yards, is less than the danger level that there is to perform at 10 yards. Do you kind of see where I'm going with this? So, and you can get good with an SBR at least to 300 yards. You can't. I mean, I can ring steel with this. No issue. Now again, how deadly is it versus 16 inch? You know, maybe less deadly, but we've already talked about a lot of variables that go into that. What ammo are you shooting? Etc. Etc. Right. Um, now one thing that will give the 16 inch more is if you have like an optic that makes sense on it. I'm not against an LPVO on SBR, but I think you're adding a lot of weight when part of why I like an SBR is less weight. So putting a scope on a 16 inch, where I think it'd be fine to also run a Neotech with magnifier, putting a gun on a 16 inch, you're going to work out more accuracy. So there, there is going to be even more of an edge to 16 inch. Now again, going back to what I'm talking about, I could train a lot at 300 yards with either of these guns, on paper, with steel, whatever, and it wouldn't take much for me to get really good. It takes a lot to be really good at pistol to rifle transitions rifle to pistol transitions rather, and keeping the gun up, I mean, I, believe it or not, to get good at CQB, one of the things I did was come LARP around my house, right? If I'm home alone, I may be like, oh, I gotta go to the bathroom. So I select a bathroom farthest away from where I'm at and make a maneuver with my gun. It's just practicing the rhythm of getting around doorways, keeping the gun in front of your eye, it's easy to get lazy, especially as a, as a perishable skill, both shooting and CQB itself. So, when I practice those things, it helps. It takes a lot of effort to maintain that. One of the reasons I'm finding that I prefer the EOTech over the T2 is because when you haven't been doing as much CQB and your, your body's starting to get lazy, the EOTech is more forgiving than the T2. Also for night vision, there's no question the EOTech is better. But, <clears throat> I digress. Going back to the training, it's it's harder to do CQB, I would say, successfully than long range. So, what are you training for, and what are you able to train for? Again, I could practice 300 yard shots all day long with either of these guns, get really good, wouldn't take much. CQB, getting that muscle memory down, fighting fatigue, lasting longer, holding out your arm. Because as you get tired, your hand moves in. I mean, and eventually you're just doing whatever you can, you know? And so, again. So the next thing I'm going to touch on is setting up your gun for the mission, right? Um, don't do that. You can set your weapon up for the mission, but the enemy's going to try to draw you into fire uh, shooting on their terms. So, basically, you can, you can do all this, like, oh, this is my intent, this is what I'm going to do, this is what this scenario is going to hold or have in store for me, and then when you get there, and there's there's a saying that I learned uh, years, years ago, and it is, the enemy always has a vote. 
So whoever you're combating always has a say in the scenario. So being thoughtful about what scenario you might find yourself in, not what scenario you might choose, what scenario you might find yourself in, that means that maybe you should set up your configuration for that situation. So meaning um, most people aren't going to want to play duck with somebody who's armed. They're going to want to go somewhere where you can't see them or possibly find them. So something like retreating into a building or someone is hiding in your house that does not belong. So again, the mission is to get them out. Ideally, you would want to be able to shoot at distance. It's a realistic thing to want, but may not be a realistic thing to encounter. So setting up your weapon for a more close to environment where you're going to be in a scenario that someone else is choosing and probably has more choice than you is something to consider. So now moving into an aspect uh, regarding barrel length and suppressors that isn't weight and balance uh, focus is the more space you have for gas, the smoother your whole system is going to run, suppressed or not. Um, so longer barrel, more space for gas. That's just how it works. Um, <clears throat> so for instance, I ran a very restrictive Gemtech G5, or I should say the very restrictive Gemtech G5 on my 11.5, could not finish zeroing it, couldn't fire five rounds through it, it was so bad and gassy, way worse than my Mark 18 ever was. Um, then G5 on a 16 inch, able to do it, no problem. Uh, the reason I don't do it so much is because um, I can see some accelerated parts wear, so I just don't want to put undue stress on the gun if I don't have to. The G5 is quiet. But that's about the only benefit it serves other than um, some flash suppression. Uh, outside of that, I really won't run my Gemtech 1 on these the most. Um, suppressor word of advice, if you haven't seen some of my other videos, having the same muzzle devices with a couple different options for cans can really help you out. So I was able to go from a restrictive 5.56 on this and go up to a 30 cal can that allowed for more gas flow, therefore I could have a weapon that was suppressed and zeroed. So. That's just nice. Um, next. So parts wear um, comes down to, you know, kind of similar to, to with the suppressor, just how the system runs. 16-inch um, longer barrels are just going to be better at managing that. Now, that doesn't mean when you watch this video, you like go back and forth with all my points and you're like, oh, 16-inch well, now. No, you just need to prepare for, for wearing out a part, maybe have an extra bolt carrier group. Some are relatively inexpensive and still pretty good or spend a lot of money on one that's like made out of you know titanium and diced lions and unobtainium and that way it doesn't you know ever wear out so I mean just manage that but understand something you need to be thinking about um, still again I'm an SBR guy so these are just things I'm aware of and have plans to work around if I need be now these MCX's actually run pretty good as far as taking abuse and they run surprisingly clean even when suppressed, which is a mystery because it's an awful lot of gas. Uh, piston guns are gassy. Don't let people fool you. Anyway, moving on. So optics, um, it'd be ideal to have a optic on something like a 16 inch that you can really milk some distance out of. You know, take advantage of its ability to reach out and touch people. So on here I have an LPVO Vortex 1 to 10. Um, it, uh, and I got T2 on top. And so, um, you know, it allows me to, to kind of get a little more distance out of this. Um, at the end of the day, would it be okay to run an EOTech with a magnifier? Absolutely, I think. Um, and on this SBR, I wouldn't optic shame someone wanting to put an LPVO on there. Uh, being able to zoom can actually help you dial in your shots when you're shooting at further distances where your groups are getting a little more spread out because your gun can't reach out that far as well. So... All things to think about. Running an L can on either one, great. Um, for CQB guns or SBRs, I do recommend. I mean, a magnifier can do similar as an LPVO when it comes to calling your shots. Um, I'm more of an EOTech guy. I'm trying this T2 out, but I think I'll have an EOTech on this on the in the end. Um, but either way, I think really uh, red dot or holographic weapon sight with a magnifier is the way to go, especially because you can pull the magnifier off if you don't think you'll need it, and then put it back on when you do, if you do. And uh, with a 16 inch, um, LPVO is kind of in the middle, but there's a lot to know about those. I don't want to get into that in this video. 
uh, but something to think about. One thing I'll add for is um, optics on the bigger guns. You got a bigger gun, it's heavier, and you're putting an optic that is then bigger and heavier. And so, kind of funny. Um, I'm not saying don't do that, but to me, again, so I kind of like the SBR is you're kind of um, adhering your optic setup to the gun itself. So, um, this I felt obligated to get a heavier setup because I wanted to take advantage, as I said, of its ability to reach out and touch. So caliber plays a role, right? Um, you know, most of this video is aimed at 5.56, but, you know, things to think about, like 308, um, cutting off 3 inches from a scar at 16 inch to 13 inch. Um, I haven't had experience with that, so I don't want to comment on if you should do that or not, because um, I don't have the answer. I'd be curious. Um, I mean, obviously maneuverability, some of these things we just know we're going to apply, but I'd be curious what the ballistics difference is, very much so, especially at distance. Um, and how doable it is. So, things to think about, I think 6ARC is one of those that shorter barrel AR, 6ARC outperforms 5.56. And of course, depending on what you're doing, what kind of ammo you have with your blackout, it outperforms or at least keeps up with 5.56 and other avenues. Um, I do always say if you're going to have a 300 blackout, you should already have a 5.56. Don't have a 300 blackout be your only gun. So, all things to consider. So, training, I talked a bit on that, but, um, do make sure whatever you go with that when you have an opportunity to train with it a different way than you normally do, do take that opportunity. So, you know, if, if you're like me, a lot of your shooting is 50 yards and in, you know, rifle to pistol, pistol to rifle, mag changes, all that behind barriers, um, you know, do that as your normal routine, right? That's why you got that gun. But if you have a chance to shoot at further distances, you should do that. You should collect some dope and have some idea about how your gun behaves with what ammo at those distances. Uh, make as many notes as you can. I understand you're getting, as I said, get a gun that fits your ability to train. So, you know, um, fo focus on what you got it for and how you train, but make sure that you don't turn down opportunities when you can to kind of see the other parts of what your, your gun can achieve, right? Um, like, 11.5556 could reach out to 500 yards. Is it probably pretty ugly? Probably. But can it do it? Yes. So the close, I'm not really a huge long summary to say this time, but uh, I will say that a friend of mine, I'll enter an anecdote, a friend of mine got back from a deployment. Um, he is, uh, he got back from a deployment, and um, he had an SBR on his deployment, 11.5. And, uh, you know, I was talking to him about 11.5 and barrel length and all that, and, um, he might have even had an LPV on his, now that I think about it. Razor 1 to 10. But anyway, the point is, is that he said, uh, when I said, you know, oh, you know, I just, you know, how effective is it at 300 meters? And there was this pause, and he just said, it will kill at 300 meters. So, um... That was one thing that kind of made me, because you read the forums and people are like, oh, you know, it's good, you know, 5.56 five, and 11.5 is good to 50 yards, which I, I already know that's bullshit. I don't need help figuring that out, but um, it's just funny because this guy was like, no, it'll kill 300 yards, meters, whatever. So, point is, don't just believe everything you read and see on the internet. Um, and so, moving on from there, I think this would be less of a discussion if the NFA didn't exist. Um, I think that if it, if it wasn't such an ordeal to get an SBR, quote-unquote, I think you would see more 12.5s and, um, and probably more 11.5s. And, and I don't think this debate, I think a lot of people are trying to be talked out of getting a tax stamp or just getting one illegally and you know sold on their 16 inch and i i do agree i mean there is there's a lot of credence to having 16 inch and being realistic about well i don't want to do cqb right you don't i totally agree <clears throat> but for reasons i mentioned doesn't mean you shouldn't have a tool that's good at cqb so um <clears throat> all that said this has been james donaldson with the contemporary gentleman and until next time keep your composure